Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Chairman Lance. Here. Vice Chair Dorman. Representative Weber. Bratton. Here. Burns. Here. Fraker. Zosen. Here. Hurst. Kelly. Here. Lynch. Here. Smith. Walker. Present. We have a quorum present. We will now open the hearing on House Bills 116 and 569, which are identical bills. Representative Burleson will be the bill handler. Representative Burleson, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Eric Burleson. I'm a state representative from the Springfield and the city of Battlefield area. And I'm honored to bring this bill to you today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, freedom to work is necessary if Missouri wishes to regain a competitive standing with the states that surround us. This important legislation will encourage job growth, make unions responsive and stronger, and promote the individual freedom of workers across our great state. For far too long, Missourians have left the state to find job opportunities elsewhere. Over the past decade, Missouri has lost jobs and citizens to other states. The move or migration from closed shop states to freedom to work states is proof positive of this fact and is part of the reason that Missouri now has less representation in U.S. Congress. In fact, since 2000, nearly 5 million Americans have migrated or moved to the 24 states that have freedom to work laws in place. One quarter of those states that have these laws in place border the state of Missouri. And we have, they have been a continuous drain on job growth and often siphoning businesses along with those jobs over to those neighboring states. From 2002 to 2012, according to the U.S. Department of, of Labor, statewide private sector payroll employment and right to work Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Tennessee collectively increased by 3% compared to a 1.6% decline for Missouri. I think this data is probably the most striking data. So what if you take the states that surround us within, within the Midwest, we're not talking about East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, we're talking about within our region, the states that surround Missouri, those six states, over the last 10 year period that we have data for, in the private sector payroll, we saw that those states that surround us, they saw a 3% increase during that period while we saw a 1.6% decline in Missouri. So, it would be wonderful if we had data that was even more precise, in fact we do. Okay, so to get even more precise, during that same period of time, we know as a whole, our state did worse than those states that are, that are right to work and surround us. But if you just, if we, but we have the data regarding the counties that border those states. So if you take the, the data that, of those counties over the same period of time, from 2002 to 2012, the total private sector payroll employment in the 33 Missouri counties that border those six right to work states, including Clark and New Madrid, they fell in Missouri by 2.3%. So they didn't fall by 1.6. They fell even further because they're neighboring a state that has right to work. So the, the, the difference is stark when you get closer to the borders. And if at the same period of time in those states, that are just on the other side of the border, those six states, they saw their numbers increase by 5.6%. So as you get closer to the borders in Missouri, it becomes, the, the difference becomes much more stark. <clears throat> the truth is that nothing protects your job and increases your salary like job abundance and more job opportunities. There is no job security better than having an employer down the road who is hiring workers in your field. Data proves that wages rise faster in freedom to work states because of job abundance. Now, you'll hear people today say that people make less money 
in freedom to work states. But that is not considering what, that, what the data they'll bring today, and this is something that you should ask them, is the data that they're bringing forward, data as I brought forward, that's specific to county by county? Is it specific to Midwest data? What you'll typically hear is they will say, people in the United States, the state of Missouri, people on average make less money, or, or the, the states that are right to work make less money. But the truth is, states in the southern states, we've always made, made less money. And if you use that kind of logic, just that kind of sweeping logic, you could also come to some other strange conclusions. You could say, for some reason, the data concludes that states that have right-to-work laws in place also have warmer climates. You could also conclude that they have a higher propensity of having hurricane damage. You could also conclude that people, for some reason, in states that have right-to-work laws also see, we see much more alligator bites but you see the absurdity in those arguments. You need to use data that's clearly defining down to uh, what's, where the difference is. This data does that. They, but they'll say people make less money, but it's also myopic in its, and short-sighted in, in longitudinal. Over a period of time, it just doesn't hold out. Just simply ask the workers in Detroit if the unions were able to keep their jobs and their salaries increasing over, over the natural rate over a long period of time. Or ask the former workers at the Chrysler plant in St. Louis, or the former workers at the Solo Cup in Springfield, or the former workers at, at Regal in Springfield if their salaries have risen faster. A study by Ball State University in 2012 determined in their research that that when they examined the manufacturing sectors of 10 right-to-work states for 10 years right after those states basically passed right-to-work laws and became right-to-work states, they found that these results paint an interesting story about the effect that this legislation has with individual states. In seven of the 10 states, the cumulative 10-year impact was an increase in inflation-adjusted manufacturing incomes of between 15% and 40%. This suggests either a growth in the number of manufacturing jobs in these states, higher wages for existing manufacturing jobs, or both. This results from an increase in manufacturing jobs or wages or both. We have to be honest with ourselves and recognize that businesses, when seeking a new location for plants and facilities, often list as a high priority in their criteria that the state they're locating to needs to be a freedom to work state. And I've spoken with a number of location advisory firms. The way that they, the way they, the conversation goes is that it's not, it's not the, it may not be the end all be all, but for many states, it's very much like the way in which you look for the, for your next home. If you and your wife or you and your spouse decide that you're looking for a three bedroom, two bath, three car garage home, and that's what you check on the search, then you're gonna miss out on homes that, that have it just a two-car garage. But if that's what you're looking for, then you're, then you're never gonna even take a look at, at those homes. And in the same way, many businesses uh, do not look at Missouri because of that. So and I'm gonna to quote two leading, uh, two leading location uh, companies who are site location, uh, who, who help businesses find a site. Um, including John Sisson, who is the principal of Global Location Strategies, he who has completed hundreds of successful site selection assignments for his clients with a total investment value exceeding $21 billion. He told me and that I could share this with the committee that, quote, our clients frequently eliminate a location if it is not a right to work state before we are even allowed to share that state's best attributes, end quote. Andy Shapiro, the director of Biggins, Lacey, Shapiro & Company, said that, quote, right to work is often a threshold factor, meaning that our clients will eliminate the location without further consideration, and he said this happens at least 60% of the time, end quote. Missouri will benefit from this legislation by luring jobs, investment, and increased revenue instead of losing out on that time after time. I also believe that, and the data indicates, that, that worker freedom laws will strengthen unions. 
and make, help them be more accountable to their workers. States like Missouri with forced unionism are losing population revenue and growth because union leaders do not have to be responsive to provide value to their workers as they do in states where workers have freedom. If you look at the data, and it's true, right to work, uh, passing right to work laws, freedom to work laws, does, unions don't disappear in those states, they become stronger. The public sector unions in this state are currently voluntary. They are currently operating in the same way with right to work um, arrangements. And so ask yourself, are these, are these unions, are they ineffective unions? Is the FOP ineffective? Is the IAFF an ineffective union? Is the M MSTA or the, or the Missouri NEA, are they ineffective? And the truth is we all know that they are very effective and they are very responsive to their members. Unions are more responsive and provide better services when their members have a choice. Allowing workers to have freedom to join a union strengthens each union by giving them the drive to keep up with an ever-changing workplace. A workplace which right now, in this economy, and this global economy, a workplace that desperately needs their union organizations to be strong and responsive to their members and empowering them to compete in today's global market. There are countless associations that represent the interests of Missouri that operate in this way. And simply put, the fact that members can leave makes these associations better. But at the end of the day, this is about promoting an individual and their freedom. Article 1, Section 29 of the Missouri Constitution states that employees shall have the right to organize and bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing. America was founded on the principles of guaranteeing individual rights and ensuring that those rights are protected from the mob rule or the majority rule. We believe that workers deserve a right to choose. It's just not fair in today's world that anyone should have a government-created monopoly that supplies them members and revenue. Unions should fight for their members and earn their support. Unions are working on behalf of their employees. Their employees will be happy to contribute. If, work, if not, workers should have the right to pull their financial contributions and keep their own take-home pay. At the end of the day, this is about protecting that individual right. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Representative Weber. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Gentlemen, do you believe that workplace safety is something that's important? I do. Okay. And you and I have been in the House for seven years now, right? Which bills have we passed that increase worker safety in Missouri workplaces? Gentlemen, you're, you're asking me, right now I'm bringing this bill to you today. I'm not bringing any of the bills that we worked on, and that's... Which bills have we worked on that increased in mean, seven years? Gentlemen, I, I'm not... I'm not Wikipedia or the. Do you recall any? I don't all recall all a single one. Seven years, I don't recall a single bill this body has passed that increases workplace safety. I mean, do, do you recall any of them? Gentlemen, if you're looking for things outside of this bill, I would suggest that you pull up Google. Okay, well, this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is how it really. It's not my responsibility to be your research. This is how. This is, outside of this is how. I can answer. I let, you talk, I let you talk for 20 minutes. You can let me answer my question. Gentlemen, I'm happy to answer a question related to this bill. My question related to this bill is this. If you believe that workplace safety is important, and I believe it's important, and, but we've been here for seven years, and we can't think of a single time this legislature has stepped up and tried to protect workers, who do you think is going to do that? Gentlemen, I believe if, if, a, if a member is finding that their union is not fighting for them to make sure that their work environment is safe, so you think it is going to be gives them that? recourse to make sure that that their organization is doing their job. So you think that you yes, agree that believe, unions are going to be the ones fighting this, for safe workplaces? I believe that this would empower a worker to make sure that it that that, that whoever is advocating for them, whether that be their it's staff, not us, it's clearly not the general assembly. That if the person that's supposed to be advocating for them, that if they're not doing their job, that gives that worker their right to choose to to basically choose what's in their best interest. So if I understand you correctly, you are saying that you believe that unions are going to be the ones that are going to fight for safer workplaces. Is that an accurate 
what I'm saying is that under the status quo, whether they are doing a good job or not, they, that's that's the, the the worker has no right. So if the union is not doing a good job advocating for workplace safety, the the member currently okay. has no recourse. But you agree it's important. Them, you agree that we've done this, nothing about it. And this you agree that unions them, are going to be the only folks that, in Missouri that fight for workplace safety. Gentlemen, you, those are words that you're creating. What I'm saying is that this will give workers another check to make certain that the organization, if that organization says they're fighting for their workplace safety, they then they have to do it or the worker has that choice. Right, and, and that, this is an interesting question. This comes up every year. Uh, you said that uh, government created monopolies. And you just referenced that there's another, you need to create another check that the, the workers can have. How are unions created? What's the, I mean, what's the process of a, of a union vote? Okay, so they're given their they're given their authority to organize under under long ago under the Wagner Act, and then and then that was subsequently altered under the Taft Harley Act. And what it allows is for people, in essence, to to collectively bargain. Right. And when they do that, when when they get the uh, the majority, then they will then they'll put in place the contract. So it's created by a vote of the workers. Correct by initial vote of the right. workers. Right, so it's not created by the government. It's workers themselves that have come together and, and already chosen. And I, I don't know if right. I missed it, but what I said is that it was. But it's enabled by the, by the Wagner Act and the Taft Hartley Act that gives that authority to workers labor to choose for themselves to right. form a union, and they can and they can choose to decertify. And, and so what that what the Wagner Act created was an environment in which, when, once that union was formed, whether those employees wanted to be a part of it or not, they had to be a member under the Wagner. And they can they can they can decertify if, if they. If there's a process for that, is there? Right a, now, right okay. Now, so the, the unions they, are accountable to their members. Since that time, they have to maintain the support that, of their members. members the, 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 because of court rulings, they do not have to join or be a member of the association, but they still have to pay dues. Folks can't free ride. And that's what's Correct. called that's what's called the uh, union security clause. And you think they should be able to free ride? Is that, gentlemen? Because you, the, because under the, federal law, the, unions have to represent every member of the bargaining unit. Under who agree with that? No, gentlemen, the union chooses. You don't agree with that. Who, you, you don't think the unions the, have to represent every member the, of the bargaining unit? The, the, the union chooses who they're going to represent by putting in their their agreement. They choose a bargaining in unit. that that's union security. Correct. Clause. But every member of that bargaining unit, they have to represent. When they put that in that clause, they can't pick and choose they, which member of the bargaining unit they represent. A union can they can omit that and not represent non members they, they can choose to not represent non-members. But you just said everybody had to be a member. Most of the time what they believe is that they have to because in their contract they have that security clause that states that they have to represent. But that clause does not so have to be the, the part that I think is important here is that there is an accountability to the membership already. It's created by workers, there's an accountability to prevent decertification to the workers. So there's there's already built-in accountability measures to unions. Gentlemen, there's a lot of folks to get through. I don't want to take up everybody's time. I think the important thing to recognize here is that you and I have been in this house for seven years, and neither one of us can think of a single piece of, of safety-oriented legislation this body's advanced. And we both agree that unions are a creation of their members, and they currently have to maintain the support of the membership in order to exist. So thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Andy Bratton? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, in any way, shape, or form, does this bill prohibit anyone from being a member of the union if they if they so choose? No. At the end of the day, that's that's what being that, in my opinion, that's what freedom is about. Is that if you by giving that freedom, it, you also have to have the other the other side of it that you also have the freedom to not exercise that. So it, the current situation is that they are forced. And, into it whether they want to or not and the only the only recourse is to try to if they want to as this uh, representative says try to decertify their union well that is that does not happen very often a member of the on the, the United United States States labor they will be labor choice I've, I've got these cases here where they've investigated election processes and here at the local 24 here in Kansas City had to redo their officer election just this year, due to their fraudulent uh, way of uh, conducting their election process, uh, it was on uh, August 25th of this year, they had to go and redo that uh, due to uh, 
really not a, uh, an open and transparent uh, election process. And, and I've got, you know, it's just case after case after case of, of a supposed, you know, uh, workers being able to speak for who they elect and, and having a voice that it's actually being suppressed and it's being controlled by, by people uh, because they really don't have uh, the power to to say they want to belong to something uh, like a union or, or if they're not speaking to them and if they're doing these types of practices uh, the way it is today they can't they can't pull out they have to quit their job go somewhere else uh, or, or they just have to put up with it and and I think it's ridiculous right I, I remember whenever this was happening in Kansas City last year there were there were officers that approached the General Assembly and, and they did so wanting to rename it. They wanted to be anonymous because they were worried about repercussions of publicly coming out against being going into a closed shop environment. And that is, that's the frustration because at the end of the day, often this subject is, is wrapped around fear and intimidation. At the end of the day, if you remove that, and I think if you look at the facts and remove that, no one should be afraid of giving workers freedom. That, but that's that's really what most of it boils down to is where is is fear and trying to and trying to use force and intimidation to uh, to argue against at the end of the day. But if you have nothing to be afraid of, give people the freedom, give them the choice. Right. I totally agree. And, and with the training standards and things like that, and the safety. I mean, we have an organization called OSHA that goes around and ensures businesses and trades are. are are operating properly uh, and, and it's up to that that company to to ensure that their workforce is being trained whether it's union or whether it's through a, a private organization that's training their employees but to force that employee to be a part of that organization uh, is is wrong and it goes against every bit and every grain of what america is about and what our constitution enshrines and that's exactly what this bill does. It doesn't it doesn't prohibit the union from doing anything. It just en enables and, and empowers the actual worker, not the hierarchy. So, thank you, gentlemen, for this bill and your courage to do this. Thank you, Representative Smith. To inquire, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. All right. First time on the committee, so take it easy. Huh? All right. So you, um, if I wouldn't have known any better, I'd have been scared coming in here because I heard things such as sweeping logic, uh, forced unionism, freedom to work, mob rule, um, and then you brought up something about Chrysler, so I might bounce back and forth. So I'm a former Chrysler employee, worked there 13 years, UAW Local 136. And you made it seem as if right to work was the reason those two facilities shut down. The work at those facilities, uh, the truck plant I was at went to Detroit, which at that time, uh, uh, and still is right now, uh, right to work hasn't really impacted the UAW in that state, um, uh, went there. And the minivan plant shifted their operations uh, to Canada, which is a very unionized, I'm, I'm, you talk about tax burden, I know I'd start talking about taxes, you might start turning red. It, 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 you know how Canada is. So, so that was a little uh, mistruth. That, uh, have you ever been a, a member of a labor union? No. no okay. Uh, what about like a member of ALEC? No, I, I have been to ALEC meetings, yeah. Okay, so like an associate member. Okay. Um, and gentlemen, I, I always find the, the, the line on ALEC comical because... No, I'm just asking the, a question. I'm just because, asking a question of your memberships because I'm a union member now. Yeah, I'm a uh, machinist now, District 837. Right. Um, now, and I'll, I'll say the iron, the, the funny thing is that while you can go and find language... I, I ain't found nothing. Website, I just asked the question. The, the, this yes, this language has been around since the Taft-Hartley Act. Mm -hmm. and many states have implemented this because it's, in, it's empowered by the Taft-Hartley Act. So it's wrong? No, what I'm saying is that that this, as a mechanism, has been around since the 50s. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for the historical uh, uh, standpoint. So it's it's it, it, here's the there's a lot of issues I have here. Um, you, you threw out a uh, quoted a lot of different numbers, and, and there's going to be other people both sides that have a whole lot of numbers too. And you can make numbers 
kind of look how you want the numbers to look. And I noticed you uh, you said something about six states. Now you didn't include Illinois in your. Well, why didn't you include Illinois? Because they because they also they're not a right to work state. Okay, but why didn't you include like their growth or their counties? Or? Because I'm trying to compare the difference in growth between states in the Midwest, including Missouri, and and the difference between those. So okay, okay. Gotta, but, but using kind of your uh, non sweeping logic. Um, States that do not have, um, I really call it the freedom to work, not the, not the way you use it, uh, such as Missouri, uh, such as Illinois. Uh, you wouldn't think any company would ever want to do any sort of business here, uh, given the numbers that you put out in your data. Right. And, but they do. And, and to continue with the analogy, people still buy homes with two bedrooms, three baths, mm -hmm. and two car garage. Right. But we're talking about what I'm saying is that employers moving what I'm to the saying state is that, in job opportunity. What I'm saying is that the data is clear that, that all things being equal, those states that have this mechanism in place, you do see a bump in employment. You see a, a bump in, uh, in, in wage growth. You see... You see, but, but what what sectors, which employment are we talking about? Public sector, because that was in, in, in Texas that happened. Big time. A lot of people throw Texas out there, but they don't differentiate the numbers between uh, uh, public jobs and, and, and private jobs that were created. They just throw, hey, we got growth, it's right to work. They used to like to use it. Uh, well, I'll say the, the, I've got data, there's data all around, but the data that I quoted were, were very specific that within the, in its private sector, including the state of Missouri and the six states that surround us, and then more specifically, within the state of Missouri, the counties, the 33 counties that border those six states. Okay. Um, and the yeah. counties that, that are on the adjacent side of those borders. And, and I know Tennessee was one of those states you, you used, right? Right. Have you been to Tennessee lately? Have you checked out wages in Tennessee? Yeah. So I'm, I'm using the, the data from the six surrounding states. I, I get it, but I, I'm just talking about like realistic, like drive to Memphis. Drive and I'm not using Ripley. anecdotal data. You know, and I'm, I'm talking about real stuff that I've seen and people right. I've talked to. In, you can, in Oklahoma. I mean, you can find any Oklahoma's isolated. Doing horrible. You can find some situation horrible. in isolation. They had more I'm, businesses leave Oklahoma after right to work than it was. So we could say, hey, it's because of right to work. There's a lot of factors with that, but we have to, and we, it, we have to be honest. And gentlemen, this. also, it's not about where the state is, it's about what, it's about acceleration. Do you understand? You know what I'm saying? The difference yeah, between if you're what is your current you have speed? Corn fields like, what is your like, current uh, speed and what, like, what do you accelerate uh, South, to? South, South Carolina did that. So South Carolina uh, had nothing, just the fields of nothing. They right to work. Uh, they were they spent about a billion dollars of taxpayers' money to, to, to lure a company down there. Said, hey, you don't have to pay anything and no work guarantee. So yeah, you're going to see growth when you put that on the uh, table. You know, who's, gentlemen, I'm not who's a fan gonna, of those kind of... Who, who, uh, who's not going to do it? You know, you've seen my voting record. I don't support... Yeah. Uh, that no, I, and, I, and I'll go and I'll be, and hopefully keep that going, but this right here, I don't see why. In a processor, if you ever belong to a, a, a labor union, a uh, labor organization, you know if you're not happy, uh, Hey, I can vote out the leadership that's in there now, come next election, there's no gun held to my head. Or if I'm completely not help, happy with this whole system, um, we can decertify. And it happens. It happens. You can search it on Google, the internet. They don't lie on that, right? Um, and, and find all this information on there. So before, even before all of that, if I'm so anti-union, you know what? I just don't work at that place. So you're saying work wherever so you want to work. No, you're saying so you, work wherever saying, you want to work, and even though there's an if you established... Want, let's, you're saying if you no, want to work... No, let me finish what I'm saying, and I'll tell you what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> you're, you're saying that I have ultimate right to, to do whatever I want to do when I'm an employer and I do this. I mean, use that same logic with, with uh, us and our representative districts. The majority of the people voted you in and voted me. Right. So if the people on the other side who weren't successful, do they have the right to say, no, I'm just going to create my own state representative and re represent my... It, it doesn't right. work that hey, way. Gentlemen, this is, this is government. You're, what you're saying, you're giving an analogy of giving governmental power to an organ one organization. I'm giving an example and you're giving the majority. Them, you're, giving them for, you're giving them the power to coerce. You're giving them the power to 
force an individual to force. to not necessarily join, but I don't have to work there, right? Pay membership fees. Do I have to work there? Am I forced? Is somebody holding a and firearm in my head saying you're going to work at Boeing? What you're, you're going, saying no. is that the employer of that organization no. does not have the right to negotiate with an individual unless they do it. All right, how about through. this? We're going to flip this around. Okay, so given your logic and you're thinking, and I'll be quiet in a second, Mr. Chair, I don't want to hog everything. Um, so I'm in one of these environments. I choose not to be part of the bargaining unit. So I should not reap any of the benefits that that bargaining unit has, right? I would agree. Really? Yes. Really? <laughs> this, this is the first time, and we got this on record, so you, were, you, you heard that too. So, and then I'm going to bring up this one thing, and it's uh, you'll probably have the Chamber of Commerce come up, and they'll, they'll be for this. Um, or, or uh, let me use this example. Do you have a homeowners association where you live? Uh, gentlemen, that's it's a that's also a government entity. I'm they, just asking. They're, they're do, given, do you have one? They, they, it's a government entity. Yeah. Do you have one? And what? So if your neighbor is, decides not to pay into that homeowner association, but the rest of you all are doing it, right. what happens to that owner? Nothing, or does there's some sort of lawsuit to recoup that money that 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 owner is in pain? Yeah, gentlemen, that's that is a government entity. So you don't like freeloaders in that sense. But you're okay with the freeloader? The question that we should ask is do we want to give the coercive power of government to one organization? You switched that up over right there, but you know I'm right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Are you going to maintain decorum here, or I'll clear this room of everyone except the witnesses? Thank you. Are you? Oh, yeah, I said I was done. Thank you very much. Representative Burns? Yes, Mr. Chairman. The, um, I do acquire. Um, gentlemen, you said that you've never belonged to a labor union? No. How about any member of your family? Um, Father, what, mother, brother, sister? I, I would rather not say what, okay. what members of my My point is, so you've really never had any experience working in an organized labor body. I have not had personal Okay. Experience. Well, I've had 49 years of it, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. In 1972, we walked 13 weeks, starting in February, to join the Teamsters Union because our owner was cheating us on our pay. You brought up about union and the coercion. I'm a member of the Teamsters, okay? This is a Teamster magazine for anybody that wants to see it. It's put out every quarter. In the back of this magazine is a little section that has three federal judges over it. Judge Savetti, Saletti, De Genoa, and William Webster. And they've been there since the first Bush administration, appointed by President Bush, to watch over the Teamster Union. Now, do you think, seriously, if there were any coercion going on with the Teamsters, that these three reputable, highly have highest integrity federal judges wouldn't have pointed it out? And on top of that, they just gave the Teamsters a clean bill of health. So I'd like to know where you're getting your data from and see that data of coercion. Gentlemen, I, I don't have, need to have data of accidents. You tell, wait a minute, you're quoting. I'm, I'm saying this is like a court of law because you're talking about people's livelihoods here. Gentlemen, I'm saying... Produce what you're saying. I'm saying that the, st the statutes, or the, the, the federal law... You the said there's coercion. Let's, let's see your evidence of the coercion. Gentlemen, I'm not. I'm, I, there are plenty of. I, in fact, there are probably witnesses here today that can give you personal evidence. Uh, you're evidence. testifying. This but, is your testimony. But I'm saying, and I think you're you're not. Maybe you took out of context my use of it. You said I'm coercion. Saying, I'm That's against the law. We give the coercive power. We give coercive that power. That indicates that unions state. coerce people to join. Show me that data. Gentlemen, I don't have to show you. They they have the power. They force. People they don't for you. They want no, they don't. People join, and I'll tell you something well, else. I'm glad you brought that That's, up. That is okay. Because you're talking about coercion. How is this for coercion? This is how unions started, right here. On the bottom, it's, on the top, it says, never again, through solidarity and scholarship, the unions and the coal mines, after being shot down like dogs, organized and got these five and six year old kids right here in America out of the coal mines. And it says, never again through solidarity, unionism, and scholarship, they put them into classrooms where they belong. 
Now there's even a group here that wants to do away with public education, not only just the unions. So what you're really talking about is people's independence. We're the last bastion of independence in this country and in the world. And that's what you're trying to do away with. Gentlemen, states that have this in place have strong, robust unions. They have strong membership. And in fact, in those states, it, union membership doesn't go down, it goes up. In fact, you look at the numbers, over, over a period of time, we've, we've seen that union jobs in states like Missouri have declined. Will you produce that data as well? I've got that data. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to have a copy. You and I have never had a chance to converse, and I've been here three years, but I'd like to see that data. And at the end of the day, it, I, I passionately believe that if, if you feel that your union provides great value, and if it's doing a great job, people will join, just like they join the, fire, the, the firefighters, the fraternal or police, they do a great job representing their members and people join but if they're not doing a great job we our role should be to ensure the right of the individual to have that check and as you said i i think that you obviously have had a great experience with your union this would not pro preclude you from being on third generation union. and i think that's great my grandfather was alive when this was going on and why unions were important and then my father the same way so I hear a lot of data on the floor, and as normal, we don't get called on to refute that data and that those false accusations. So I would like to see uh, what unions in this state aren't doing their job. So if you have that data, again, you've made that statement, I'd like you to produce the data and the information that proves that. What, and this was, goes back to, I think, the misunderstanding that the gentleman had about Chrysler. To me, if you're, if you're trusting that they're doing their job, then they failed you when that plant is leaving. They're, when they're not leave, when they're leaving, and they say, "Well, you'll be able to keep this job because it's, you know they're they're fighting for those wages." But suddenly, that plant is no longer there. It might then that's evidence that they weren't. I'm glad you job. brought that up because uh, Representative Smith said something about those pickup truck or the town and country vans are in Canada now. I might point out to you that their UAW makes a little bit more per hour than we do here in the states. But they can produce...